Romans 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not make us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Let's pray. Father, um, thank you for this time of year and the focus that causes us to remember again what you have done. And Lord, as we consider gifts at Christmas, help us this morning to be able to put aside for just a few moments the distractions of all the things we're going to do this week, all the things we anticipate, all the wrappings that maybe still have to be done or all those that are there and we're wondering what it is, all the problems at work. For some, Father, the loneliness of Christmas time because loved ones are gone that have, have been here before, because life isn't quite the same as it used to be. Lord, there's a lot of high emotion as we go through this time of year. But for a few moments, help us this morning to focus on you. Remove from our minds all the things that would distract. And instead, help us to center on the one who has made it possible and not just that he came as a baby but did so much more. May we see that, I pray, by the power of your Holy Spirit today in Jesus' name. Amen. Elderly couple were celebrating their Christmas together and the wife said, honey, I, I bought you something unusual this year. It's, it's for the guy that has everything. And he said, oh, you, you shouldn't have. What is it? And she said, well, prepare yourself. She said, it's a, it's a deed to a cemetery plot. <laughs> I don't know about you, if I heard that, I would be wondering if there was a hidden message there somewhere, but that's what she gave him. It's, it's, it's extraordinary, it's unique, you have to admit that. Well, the next year she didn't buy anything for him. So naturally he was curious, honey, how, how, come, how come no present this year? She said, well, you still haven't used the one I gave you last year. <laughs> Good point, right? If you get a present, you ought to use it. And here's the tragic thing, beloved. There are a lot of unused presents that the Lord Jesus has made available to people all over this world that are lying, even as we speak this morning, unused, unwrapped, unwanted, unre uh, unappreciated, rejected. They're there in every home. They're available to every heart. But they have not been opened and I want us to consider a couple of those this morning because even though it's Jesus' birthday, I want to tell you the gifts that he gives are far more incredible and unbelievable than any that you will find anywhere else. The gifts of Christ, priceless. But so many times passed over in favor of something of far less value. So let's look at just three from this passage this morning, three priceless gifts of Christ. Number one, peace with God. Peace with God. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you may be asking this morning, well doesn't everybody have peace with God? And the answer, beloved, is no, no. Not everyone has peace with God. Very likely, not even everyone here this morning has peace with God. Paul describes it here as those who have been justified by faith, they have peace with God. So you say, well, what does it mean to be justified by faith? It means to be declared 
righteous, to be declared as though you've never sinned by God himself. But how does that happen? Well, he clearly here refers us back to the earlier parts of the book of Romans because he says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, he wants us to know what came before. So what came before? Well, the first three chapters of the book of Romans, God goes to great pains to remind us that all people everywhere are sinners, both by birth as well as by choice. We sin every day. We sin most moments of the day. As our minds wander to places they shouldn't be, even as we sit here this morning, we sin. We're sinners. We are therefore, beloved, at war with God, not at peace. Why is that? It's because God is holy and we are not. God is sinless and we are sinful. God is the judge, and we are those who will one day be judged by him. And interestingly enough, in the first three chapters of Romans, the verdict is already in. Turn with me to the first chapter. If you're in Romans 5, just turn back. We'll skim these chapters. We don't begin to have time to go through all of them, but look at verse 18 of chapter 1. For the wrath of God is revealed against, from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. There's so much in that verse, we can't begin to cover it all, but notice that there is the wrath of God. Yes, there is the love of God. And he tells us in Romans 5, a little later in that chapter, in verse 8, that it's the love of God. It's because God has love, that he has shown that love for us by by when we were still sinners, having Christ die for us. There is the love of God, but there's also the wrath of God. You can't say, I get this one from the Bible, but I don't get this one. They're both there. They're both parts of the character of God, just as we are complex persons. You can't define us by one word, neither can you begin to define God by one word. And part of the definition of God in the Bible is that God has wrath. Now, God's wrath is not a temper tantrum. God's wrath is his settled, persistent, consistent rejection of all sin anywhere and everywhere that is found in any place, in any person, in any way. That's because his character is spotlessly holy. And so he cannot have sin in his presence. Sin of any kind, any selfishness, any naughtiness, any going past where we should go, any slippage, any unrighteousness disqualifies us from the presence of God. That's what the Bible is teaching us in these verses. That means that every person who is on this planet starts out in the same sinking ship. Disqualified from God's presence. He tells us in chapter one, that's true of Jews. In chapter two, it's true of Romans. In chapter three, it's true of everybody. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your connections are. It doesn't matter what your ties are. He tells us in chapter two, verse one, if you'll go there, it's not just God who judges. He's saying, listen, you you judge yourself to be in this condition. Look at what it says, chapter two, verse one. He says, therefore, you have no excuse, O man or woman, Every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. What the Bible is teaching us is that we're all hypocrites. It's just a question of degree. And what this this verse is basically saying is if we hung a tape recorder around our neck and just recorded everything that we say, let's just give us a week, By the end of a week, we would have condemned enough other people for things that we ourselves do that we would be self-condemned. And we really think about it, we know that's true. We don't even need God to be the judge, we judge ourselves. Paul summarizes the whole rotten mess when he gets to chapter three. Chapter three, verse 10. 
He says, that it, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Skip to verse 23, which we've memorized. And you know the final conclusion, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So there it is, the judge has rendered his verdict. His verdict is guilty. Now what this means, think about the implications of this for a moment. This means that the greatest enemy of any person who's ever sinned, even in the slightest, and of course, we all do a lot better than that. The greatest enemy and of any person who's ever sinned is God himself. It's not your harsh boss. It's not the friend who stabs you in the back. It's not the neighbor down the street that you can't stand for whatever reason because they got dogs that run over your yard or whatever. It's none of those people. It's not even the devil himself. The greatest enemy of every person outside of Christ is God himself. The Bible says in Isaiah, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And that is enough to exempt us from the presence of God and to render him our greatest enemy. Jesus warns that we'll all know that one day. He says every secret will be uncovered. Every secret thought, every secret deed, every secret action, it'll all be on display. And then he says this. He says, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's Jesus speaking. Your greatest enemy outside of Christ is God himself, and unless our guilt can somehow be expunged, there can be no peace with him. He's not going to change to accommodate our slippage. Do you know what I mean? It's not going to happen. But to give you a feeling, because I think we often present God, wow, he's this big, harsh guy who's keeping records, and man, it's all over. Let me, let me try and give you a feel for how this looks from God's perspective, okay? And it, it's, it's so important to see his love and his, and, 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 and his holiness and his wrath all in context, God consistently in the Bible uses marital unfaithfulness to depict mankind's betrayal of him with our idols, with whatever is coming ahead of him in our life. He uses marital unfaithfulness to, pre, to, to depict that. It's all the way through the Old Testament. It's even in the New Testament. God made us sexual creatures partly for that reason. Listen, God didn't need us to be sexual creatures to reproduce. He could have come up with another way to do that, right? But he wants us to understand and so, and so let, me, let me use an illustration here from the movie Camelot. I know, you don't, you, you don't remember. I remember Camelot. A few of you may be old enough, a few of you may have watched old movies enough that you know Camelot. But most of you know the story, right? King Arthur and his queen Guinevere build the round table to facilitate peace on earth to champion peace over war. And everything goes well for a while. And then here comes the greatest knight of all, Lancelot, right? And Lancelot, he's the best. He's the purest. He's the most, he's just the most everything. And he comes along. But despite themselves, Lancelot and Guinevere fall in love. And soon they betray King Arthur. They're tormented because Arthur is a good man and they love Arthur but they choose each other thinking that he doesn't know. But of course he knows. And listen to this from that film statement that Arthur makes at one point in a heart-wrenching scene. He says this. He says, if I could choose from every woman who breathes on this earth, the face I would most love, the smile, the touch, the voice, the heart, the laugh, the soul itself, every detail and feature to the smallest strand of hair, they would all be Jenny's. If I could choose from every man who breathes on this earth a man for my brother, 
and a man for my son, a man for my friend. They would all be Lance. Yes, I love them, even in their betrayal. I love them, but they answer me with pain and torment. And they must be punished by the rules of the round table. Beloved, that could be God talking. He's not our greatest enemy because he hates us. He's our greatest enemy because we've betrayed him. Because we violate his character when we take our life into our own hands. God's wrath against sin does not spring from a heart of hatred. It springs from a heart of love that's been betrayed. For love's sake, Sin must be punished. And we find ourselves, all of us, on the wrong side of that love by the way we're born and by the way that we act after we're born. That's Romans 1 through 3. Helplessly lost. Now, thankfully, Romans doesn't end at chapter 3, right? We'd be a bust. It doesn't end at chapter 3. And when we come to chapter four, we find the solution, but it's not what you might think. It's not what you might think. It's not a do-over. That's our first thought, right? Okay, okay, I messed up, I goofed up. God will give me a do-over. I'll I'll get to do this again and I can do it better the next time. No, you won't. You'll probably do it worse the next time. And you know it and God knows it and we know it. The solution is not a do-over. The solution isn't anything that we can do. So what is the solution? The solution is a gift. It's the gift of love that God gives to us. It's the gift of his own son. It's a gift that can be accepted by faith. It's the gift of forgiveness. It's the gift of pardon. And Abraham is the example in chapter four as we get there. And so he says this in chapter four, verse two. He says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. The verse we're memorizing tells us that's not going to be the case, right? He would have something to boast about, but not before God. Why? Because God's perfect and we're not. There's no ever anything we can boast about before God. So what? For the scripture, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God. He believed that God was going to keep his promise. He believed that God was going to provide a savior. He believed when he was asked to sacrifice his own son and God stopped him in Genesis 22 and said, I'll provide a lamb. Abraham believed that God would provide a lamb. Abraham believed that God would make a way of salvation. So why Christmas? Why do we have Christmas? Why did God take human flesh upon himself and become one of us? Why did he do that? He did that, beloved, so that he could die for the sins of the world so that he could save Abraham. He did that so that he could save those older, other people in the Old Testament who believed in him, and he did it so that he could save us. The reason for Christmas is really simple. Jesus came to live the life that we can't live so that he could die the death that we were gonna have to die, so that he could pay the penalty for the sin that we could never pay, so that we could have eternal life that we could have no other way. That's Christmas. That's why Jesus came, and that's the solution to the problem, the peace with God. I mean, that's the gospel, right? That's good news. It doesn't get any better than that. The peace that that we can't earn, Jesus has already earned for us. But you gotta accept the gift. It turns out that our greatest enemy is also our greatest enemy. Friend, by far. Our greatest enemy is also our best friend and what he demands, he supplies, but he supplied it at great, great, great cost. He supplied the answer by dying the death and suffering the separation from the Father that was our penalty that we should have been doing so that he can pardon our guilt. 
But here's the catch. You say, I know there, I knew there was going to be a catch. There is a catch. You have to accept the gift. You have to pick it up and unwrap it. You have to make it yours. It's there. It's all, it's all done. It's completed, but you have to accept it. Let me try and illustrate this for you. In 1829, it was before my time. In 18, for those of you who wondered, 1829, there was a man named George Wilson living in the Philadelphia area. He killed a man when he was robbing the mails one day. They found him, they arrested him, they tried him, they convicted him, and they sentenced him to hang. And in those days, that didn't take very long. Amazingly, now the amazing thing about this is he had some high-powered friends who went to President Andrew Jackson and eventually got a pardon for George Wilson. He wasn't re really that bad a guy, he just got caught in the wrong circumstances and just happened, somebody got in the way of the bullet, right? And he, and he killed a man, but they convinced Jackson to give him a pardon. He deserves another chance, and so he issued a pardon. The problem was George Wilson refused the pardon. His guilt plagued him. He said, I've, I've been sentenced, I should die. It's the right thing that should happen, I refuse the pardon. Well, the sheriff is, you know, he's between a rock and a hard place, right? What do you do? I got, a, I got a, an order from the President of the United States not to hang this guy, and he's saying, I refuse the pardon. So he kicked it back upstairs to President Jackson, who also didn't know what to do with it, so he kicked it over to the Supreme Court, to John Marshall, who was the Chief Justice at the time, and said, what do I do? And Marshall finally rendered an opinion and said, a pardon must be accepted in order to be valid. That was, a, that was a decision unofficially rendered at that time that was made official in Burdick versus the United States in 1915 when a similar case came up. And so it's the law of the land. And beloved, it's a universal law. If you, if you refuse the pardon, there's no hope. Pardon has to be accepted. And so George Wilson went to his death by hanging even as the pardon lay on the sheriff's desk. Don't let that be you. How could you possibly turn down the pardon that God himself paid for by his blood on the cross? We have to accept his pardon. It's only those who have accepted the pardon from God that we can say about them, since you have been justified by faith. You have peace with God through your Lord Jesus Christ. Gift number one from Jesus is peace with God. Failing to unwrap the gift of pardon that he offers, you're still at war. But here's the thing, beloved, that's a war you can't win. Peace with God. Second thing in this passage back in Romans 5. Wonderful gift, the promise of glory. Promise of glory. Now keep in mind that Paul has just told his readers in Romans 3.23, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, right? Fall short of it. But now Paul says in the second half of Romans 5.2, Second half of the verse, he says, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. How can we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God if we fall short of the glory of God? Paul answers that question a lot of places, but he answers it really in a simple way in Colossians 1.27. Don't turn there, but in Colossians 1.27, Paul describes the gospel this way. It's the same way Jesus described it in John 17.3, if you want to check them out. But Paul describes the gospel as this. The gospel is Christ in you. The hope of glory. The hope of glory is a person. Eternal life is a person. Jesus said in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you and the only begotten Son that you have sent. It's all in Christ. 
It's Christ in us and us in Christ, those who've come to Christ by faith, those who have unwrapped the package, those who've taken the gift, made possible the hope of glory. It's the hope of glory. Christ becomes the focus of our life. He becomes the focus of everything we're about. And his greatest gift is it will be with him forever. He's the hope of glory. He's the hope that we will have a place forever. We as believers are not going nowhere, we're going somewhere. That's a good thing to know. It's a great gift to have. Now the word hope that's used here, we should mention, is not used in the sense of maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. That's obviously the way we think of that word in our English version, right? It's not the biblical way that hope is used. Hope is in, the, in the Bible means something that's certain that just hasn't happened yet. So we're looking for it, we're hoping for it in that sense, but it's a certainty that just hasn't happened. Heaven hasn't happened yet. Eternity for us who are sitting here this morning hasn't happened yet, eternity with Jesus, but it will. It's just as sure as the resurrection of Christ. It's as sure as all the promises of God. It's that reality that causes us to be able to live above the circumstances. And let me tell you, the promises of God with regard to this are mind-blowing. They're mind-blowing. Listen to what he says in 1 John 3, verse 2. If you haven't memorized this, this is a good one to memorize. Beloved, we are God's children now. Already in that category. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. We're going to be like Christ. No sin, no imperfections, no Mourning, no sorrow, no grief. All the promises that he makes at the end of Revelation 20 will be ours, will be just like Jesus. Jesus prayed for this in John 17, the night before he's being crucified. He prays for those who will become believers. And he says this about him. He says, the glory that you, the Father, he's addressing the Father, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. You share in the glory of Christ as a believer? Listen to this description of the glory of Christ in Revelation 21, verse 23. Tells us that in heaven there's not going to be any sun or moon. The new heavens and the new earth that God's going to recreate. No heaven, no sun, no moon. Because, Revelation 21, 23, the glory of God gives it light. Are you kidding me? And, and, and Jesus shares that glory with us? Absolutely. Here's what he says in Matthew 13, verse 43. He says, then... The righteous, those who have been pardoned, because they've accepted the gift, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. It's not just Jesus, we will shine too. It's a reflected shining for us, but we share the glory of Christ. It's the hope of glory that we have. Beloved, Christians have a future. People outside of Christ have no future. We live in a world where hope is increasingly difficult to come by, right? I, I think of the, the great Pulitzer Prize winning writer, James Reston for the New York Times, shortly before he died, he wrote an article where he reported, you know, after whatever number of years he'd been in Washington, he said, it's one thing is clear to me, and he says that man, the feeling is growing in Washington that man is totally incapable of solving the world's problems. It's one of those times when the New York Times and the Bible were in agreement, right? We're reaching that point. But, but, you know, we can look at that from a worldwide perspective. How about from a personal perspective? I see it every week. You don't all necessarily, but when sickness strikes, what happens? You know what I find out? When sickness strikes, hope is the only thing that really matters. At that point, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter what position you hold. It doesn't matter how much people look up to you or don't. The question is, hmm, is there really something wrong? I hope there's nothing wrong. And then it turns out, yeah, there really is something wrong. And so, the, so we go to the next level of hope. Well, I hope it's not serious. And then it occasionally turns out to be serious. And so now we're hoping, well, okay, it's serious, but I sure hope they can fix it. 
But we all know that around a corner eventually for all of us, right, there's gonna be that final verdict. It's terminal. It's inevitable. It doesn't really matter whether it's cancer, whether it's a heart, whether it's some unknown thing. It doesn't really matter what it is. We have a limited shelf life here in this life, right? And if your hope only extends to this life, it's not much hope. Because I can tell you right now, it's not gonna work. You're gonna die. Our hope, if it's worth anything, needs to extend beyond that. And that's where we see so many tragedies in life. I think of a guy like Bertrand Russell, you know, one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century. But a man whose philosophy led him to live an immoral lifestyle, even living for a time with his daughter-in-law, went on and on. Bertrand Russell got at the, at the end of life, either 96 or 98, depending on which account you read of him. His birth date is a question mark, but when he got to the end of life, he said on his deathbed, he said, philosophy has been a total washout for me. That's a guy that spent his whole life pinning every hope he had on philosophy. One of the last statements of George Bernard Shaw before his death was he said, I I pinned all my hopes on atheism. And and we know why he did that. He wanted to live the life he wanted to live. He didn't want to believe that he would be judged. He didn't want to believe there was accountability. And so he he just easily, he just erased God out of the picture. You erase God out of the picture, there's no accountability. But as he got closer to the time of his immortality and realized he was coming to the end of this life, his hope faded badly as it does for most people. I won't say everybody, but I see it. Most people outside of Christ, when they're faced with the fact of their own mortality, fade. Just like he did. And listen to this statement. This is a profound statement. He said this, he says, you're looking at an atheist who has lost his faith. Think about that. And if you really think about it, you'll see it makes sense. Because why? Because it takes just as much faith to believe in no God as it does to believe in the revealed God of the Bible. In fact, I'd make the argument it takes more faith over here and try to do that occasionally as we come to consider the word of God. As he realized that he's running out of time and if his faith in atheism is wrong, then then when, when an atheist loses his faith, what's left? There is a God. There is an accountability. And I'm not ready. Compare that to Paul, who was a murderer who had lived, a, you know, lived a, what, he, what he thought was a highly religious lifestyle, but in the process it had taken him to do some of the grossest sins of all, to, to, to kill people. And yet Paul came to faith in Christ so that he could say as he approached the end, he could say this in Titus 2.13. He says that believers, including himself, are waiting for our blessed hope, our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you have a hope this morning, beloved, that goes beyond this life? And is it founded in anything real? Christians have a future. They're like no one else on earth. The hope of naturalism, you know what the hope of naturalism is? Is that you're just, you're just gonna disappear, body and soul. Well, you don't even have a soul, according to the naturalists, so your body just disappears, disintegrates, you're gone. That's the hope. The hope of those who subscribe to Eastern religion, who do believe in a soul or an immaterial part of the body, their hope is that you will become part of the all, the whole, the universal, impersonal, pantheistic God who has no glory. Just is what is. Contrast that to the Bible that tells us that we have a hope in Christ for an identity that includes both body and soul. It's a wonderful identity. 
It's a perfect existence going forward, stated a lot of ways in the Bible, but he says it this way in Revelation 3.17, John says to the one, or Jesus is speaking there, he says to the one who conquers, that's the believer, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, which is eternal sustenance, it's an eternal promise, and I will give him a white stone with a new name, complete new identity. I'll give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. That's an identity in Christ that will be yours alone. And by the way, that includes not just soul, that includes body because, because Paul promises in Philippians 3.20 that Jesus is also going to give us, will tra- he, says, he says it this way, he will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Is that good or what? You know, if you don't believe that happened, all you got to do is look back and check out the resurrection and find out, was Jesus there afterwards? Did he have a body afterwards? Was it a glorious body that he had afterwards? Absolutely. These aren't just fairy tale things. This is the hope that we have in Christ. Believers have a future. Donald Gray Barnhouse was a pastor at the uh, great 10th Avenue Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, a great church to this day, wonderful church. But he was pastoring in the 40s and 50s. And he had four small children, two girls and two boys, when his wife, Ruth, passed away of cancer. As they were driving back from the memorial service, on the day that they had that, the kids were, of course, overcome by grief and Dr. Barnhouse was trying to think of some way to comfort and to encourage them. And as they were driving along, a huge moving van came alongside and the shadow of the moving van overshadowed their car and inspiration struck. Barnhouse looked at his kids and he said, children, would you rather be run over by a truck or by the shadow of a truck? Smart kids, they said, well, Dad, we'd rather be run over by the shadow of the truck. Shadow of a truck can't hurt anything. Barnhouse says, right. He said, did you know that 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ was run over by the truck of death so that when we face it, we're just run over by the shadow of death. He says, so... I can tell you today that your mom, although she went through death, your mom is in heaven with the Lord because the Bible tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the hope of the believer. No other religion can offer this. You tell me one other faith in this world that has a founder who has faced death, who has gone to death, and who has come back to life. Don't let anybody tell you Christianity is, li- is not unique. It's like no other. You can't get those kind of promises everywhere else. Jesus has suffered death and conquered death on our behalf. What did he say to Mary and Martha when he came to her, when their brother Lazarus had died? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He says, yeah, he's going to die physically, but he's, somebody said it this way. They said, a Christian isn't dead long enough to know he's dead. I'd put it another way. A Christian doesn't even die. Yeah, physically the body stops. If we're absent from the body and present with the Lord, it's not like there's a big interim time there. This is the hope, beloved. A hope that's a certainty that just has, hasn't happened yet, but it's the hope of every believer. It's the second present under the tree. Have you opened it? Now the third one is interesting. It's pain. See what kind of gift is that? Pain. Suffering. In the midst of these stupendous eternal gifts, God suddenly introduces suffering. I mean, is that strange or what? Strange gift. Gift of suffering. Did you ever get a gift that wasn't that great? Oh, you did. <laughs> I can tell. I was about 11 or 12 years old. Couldn't tell you exactly what, but I opened, I opened a box I'd been waiting. At our house, 11 kids. You know, and when we got old enough to buy presents, let me tell you, our tree was loaded. 
And so, you know, but we did them one at a time so we could stretch it out as long as possible. And, and I'd been waiting for this box for, you know, for, for however long it had been under the tree. I could hardly wait to open it. I opened this box and there it sat, a baseball glove. Now, wouldn't you think I would love a baseball glove? I loved baseball. I mean, I played baseball every spare minute I had. I knew all the stats of all the guys. I was into baseball. But my mom and dad, Bless their hearts. They weren't really up to date on those kind of things. And so the baseball glove that was in that box, somehow, they found the only 1920s era baseball glove still in existence. And there it lay, flat as a pancake. I mean, no pocket, you know, big, you know, spongy thing. There, were, there was no leather between the fingers. I mean, it was... If you saw the pictures of Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb and all those, that's exactly what it looked like. That's the glove I had. I, I, I truly hope, I hope, I hope I didn't show my disappointment because I, I loved mom and dad dearly. I wouldn't have wanted them to know that I didn't love the gift. I know their intention was loving, but it was nevertheless, I have to tell you, it was a total bust of a gift. Do you feel that way about opening the gift of suffering? We shouldn't. Because God's gifts are never a bust. He always knows best. I know we're probably not going to tend to rank it up there with peace with God or with the promise of hope. We're probably not going to take it there, the promise of glory, but it's no less critical to our lives because the pain is intended for our gain, both in this life and in the life to come. Yes, it is. Look at the things that fall out from this as you read through that passage again, beginning in verse three. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. And when you can begin to embrace everything that comes into your life, now you're starting to understand what the Christian life really is. That you have a loving father who would never send anything that wasn't somehow for your good and for his glory. And so we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Say, so, you know, I'd, I'd, really, I'd rather have a little less character and a little more comfort. That would be our tendency, wouldn't it? But see, that's because we don't want to be like Christ. That's because we haven't learned yet how important it is, how wonderful it is to be like Christ. That's what he's trying to do with the gift of suffering. He's trying to make us like himself. He's trying to produce growth that would come in no other way. And so we need to learn to embrace suffering. There's a, there's a wonderful verse in Philippians 1, 29. Let me just read it, but it says this, for it has been granted, and the word is actually graced. Paul makes up a word, he he takes, the, he takes the noun grace and he makes a verb out of it. He says, it has been graced to you. In other words, freely given, unmeritoriously given to you, undeservedly given to you. It has been given to you. It has been graced to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him. I love that gift. If I believe in Christ this morning, I realize that came from him, even the faith, right? To believe in him, that's a gift. Wonderful, love that gift. It's not only been grace to you that you should believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Just as important as believing in him and suffering for his sake. Wow. You know, when I think of suffering, you know, Joseph always comes to mind. Remember Joseph in the Old Testament? Genesis 39 through 50. Joseph suffered, hated and isolated by his own brothers, partly probably because of his own, he had a little, I think he had a little arrogance on his own part, but mostly because his dad loved him best. So they isolated him, they hate him. He could have become bitter, but he wasn't. His brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt, remember that? Could have become bitter. Most of us probably would have become bitter, he didn't. He faithfully ran the household of the owner who bought him there, Potiphar, who was the head of the secret service for the king of Egypt. 
And he was so faithful that he put everything under his control. And then he went away and did whatever it was he did. And in the meantime, of course, that what must have been a very beautiful young wife that he had started coming on to Joseph. Because the Bible tells us Joseph was a good looking guy himself. Because you refused the advances in that case. You're 20 whatever years old. You have no possibility that you're ever going to have a sexual relationship with anybody because you're nothing but a slave. Who's going to know? Joseph resisted her advances. So God advanced him, right? Two years in prison. She hollered rape. And he ended up in prison. He could have become bitter. But he didn't. So was this suffering all for nothing? No. God gives us the end of the story, doesn't he? And he lets us know that Joseph, because of this, became number two in Egypt. God was preparing him to become a man who, who he could put all the responsibility on in order that he could save that world from the famine that was going to be seven years, the drought that was coming for seven years. And we kind of look at that and say, wasn't well, that great? God, God advanced him to number two in Egypt. What a great deal. We missed the whole point. That's not the point of that story. The point of that story is that because Joseph was in that position, he saved the life of his brother, Judah. Judah, a really deserving guy? No, he's the guy that went out and had sex with a prostitute and was going to kill her until he found that out. And then they had a couple of kids, one of whom became an ancestor of Jesus Christ. Do you see the grace of God? And, and the reason he needed to save Judah was because God had promised the line of Christ, the Messiah, was going to come through Judah. And if Judah dies, it's all over. There is no Messiah. There's no promise. The, the promise of God has been made of no avail. And so the sexual purity and the suffering that Joseph went through and that God took him through and allowed him to come out on top was a great gift on which our salvation is based today. Because if there's no Joseph, there's no Judah. And if there's no Judah, there's no David. And if there's no David, there's no Christ. And if there's no Christ, there's no salvation. It all plays together, beloved. God knows what he's doing. And when Joseph's brothers came later, remember how he brought the whole family down to Egypt? Remember that? He brought them out of Canaan. He brought them to Egypt. 17 years later, his dad dies. And the brothers who have betrayed him to Egypt are scared to death because they're thinking, oh, I get it now. He just kept us alive because dad was here. Now he's going to kill us. And so they sent word and said, Joseph, dad wouldn't want you to do that. And then they actually went in and bowed before him and said, Joseph, you know, we're really, we really are sorry. I think Joseph had already established that. Do you remember what Joseph said to them? Genesis 50, 20. A couple of you mentioned this verse in a Bible study a few weeks ago. I was glad this is a verse that you caught on to. Here's what, G here's what Joseph said. He said, as for you, you guys, you scoundrels, I know you meant it for evil. And I suffered because of what you did. You really wanted me to die. That was your intention. You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. To bring about that many people would be kept alive, including Judah. Rest assured, beloved, when you open the gift and it turns out to be suffering, it's not a bust of a gift. It's there for a reason. I can't always tell you why. I can't always tell you what. God will never give you something that's not there for a reason. Let me close with a kind of a Christmas story. Dorothy Sayers was a, she was an early 20th century English author. She was one of the first women to graduate from Oxford University and she became a writer of mystery stories. Prolific writer actually, but the set of one, one set of her mystery stories had a, had a hero that, you know, was there all the time, like Agatha Christie's guys and whatever. And Lord Peter Whimsey was the name of this guy. He was a handsome 
aristocratic detective, but he was also single and lonely. Well, about the middle of these books, starring Lord Peter Whimsey, a girl shows up, Harriet Vane. Harriet Vane is one of the first women graduates of Oxford University, and she's a writer of mystery stories. Takes a while for this to develop, a couple of books in, she keeps rejecting his advances, but eventually they get married and they begin to solve mysteries together. Wonderful ending, right? What's going on? What's going on is this. Dorothy Sayers, who was a Christian, by the way, looked at the world that she had created and began to really like this character that she had created, but saw how lonely he was, so she inserted herself into the story to save him. Which is exactly, beloved, what in reality Jesus Christ did when God sent him to come into the story of human history to save those that God loves with all his heart. But he loves us enough that he will not impose himself on us against our will. And so the moment has to come when we submit to him in thanksgiving and recognition of all that he's done. H.G. Wells was an English author whose belief in naturalism and man's inherent goodness was devastated by two world wars, just devastated him. After he'd been such a great optimist at the beginning of his career, and he ended up saying near the end, he said, here I am at 65 and still seeking peace. Don't let that be you. Don't have to be you. The gift is there. You just have to unwrap it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the promises. Thank you for the gift. Priceless gifts. I pray that in the midst of all of our other gift unwrapping and enjoyment and family, I pray that we will recognize the greatest gift of all, the gift of Jesus. I pray that that will be true for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.